So um, I, I introduced myself fairly briefly, but just get you an understanding of the kinds of things we do in the lab. I, I heard there's quite a wide variety of backgrounds. We've got um, professors all the way to, to undergrads in the room today. Um, so it's always hard to know how to start. Um, but what I'm going to be doing is giving an overview of uh, epigenetics, essentially, to begin with. And then I'm going to step us into how the, sequ how the data is generated uh, for uh, the majority of, uh, majority of epigenomic analysis. I'll be talking about how the sequencing works what the output file is, which is a so-called FASTQ file. How many people in this room are aware of what a FASTQ file is? So half or so. So for those of you who know epigenetics already, and there's quite a few, and those of you who know what a FASTQ file is, you can perhaps have a little bit of a snooze uh, while I go through this. But I'm basically just going to give us an introduction um, and get us to the point of a FASTQ file. And then in module one, we'll do what the first step of uh, any good epigenomic analysis is, which is looking at the quality of, of that output file. And again, as, as Anne introduced, you know, the, the point of doing this all together is to provide opportunities uh, to discuss. Uh, and so I do encourage you to stop and question, and we can have that discussion. Otherwise, you know, I, I don't want to stand up here and make this didactic, right? So, so having that discussion and getting that um, uh, getting those conversations going, I think, is key to making this successful for you. Um, obviously, this is a huge field, uh, and it's impossible to cover the breadth of questions that you're going to have uh, in, in, in the context of an hour or, or even two days. So my lab focuses primarily on malignancies, uh, and we study types of cancers that are driven by uh, epigenetic dysfunction as we understand it from the perspective of genetic lesions. So we study cancers that have uh, mutations to epigenetic modifiers. And I heard some of the, the folks here in the group are also doing similar things. So for example, synovial sarcoma uh, is, a, is a type of cancer we study. We study leukemias, looking primarily at the IDH TET2 pathway uh, and, and the role that it might play in, in, uh, in initiation and progression of the tumor. So that's the kind of things my lab does. I come at it from a technology uh, perspective, so we've developed technologies for doing chip seek, RNA seek, all these various things, um, working along with Misha over the last, oh my gosh, decade, I guess now. Um, so developing various tools um, uh, to do this analysis. And more recently, we've been working on uh, a next generation tool for actually doing uh, chip seek uh, peak calling um, to get around some of the, the issues that Max2 has. We're going to get into that to some degree, but again, I think, you know, we encourage you to, to ask questions and, and probe to, 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 to understand um, some of the complexities of, of, of the field. All right. So in terms of what I'm going to be talking about today, so again, I'm very briefly going to go through some epigenomic principles. You know, what is epigenomics? Um, why do we study it? Um, I'm going to describe the basic molecular biology driving massively parallel sequencing. So this is the technology that really launched the field. I would argue that the reason most of you are here is because of the development of massively parallel sequencing. If it wasn't for that, we wouldn't be looking at the epigenome. And in fact, that's how I got into the field, because I was working from the technology side of things, working on at what at the time was the Selexa uh, platform. And CHIP, or chromatin immunoprecipitation, working with a guy by the name of Tony Kozaridis. Some of you might know him from Cambridge. We ran some of the first CHIP-seq libraries back in 2007. Because at the time, that's what the sequencing platform could do. We could generate about 10 million reads, real short 27 MERS. Uh, and it was for the first time. It was like magical. You could actually look at K4 trimethylation genome-wide. And really, I've been working from that perspective uh, ever since. So that's how I got into it. Um, but I'll be talking about that because that, of course, is the fundamental unit um, or the fundamental um, measuring technology that, uh, that a wide, not all epigenomic measurements, but certainly a, 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 a large fraction depend upon. The output of that is the FASTQ file, which becomes the input for all of the downstream analysis. And, and Misha will carry on with the description of what we do with the FASTQ file. Um, I'm going to talk about understanding some underlying principles and challenges of chip sequencing. Again, looking more from the, from the wet lab side of things, uh, but then get into some of the dry lab uh, measurements that we use. Um, and then 
uh, a very over, uh, high level overview of the analysis workflow uh, that will then feed into module two. Okay, so um, very brief history of epigenomics. So I don't know, again, some of this must probably is review for a lot of you, um, but let's remember that, um, that uh, the term heterochromatin and euchromatin, which hopefully most of you are familiar with, is actually a term that was, that was coined um, almost uh, a century ago, right? Uh, and it was coined in, in, in the context of understanding why regions of the chromosome, in this particular case, this is actually looking at MOS, but why some regions of the, of the chromosome uh, uh, took up more dye than others. So these heterochromatic regions, these densely staining regions, so-called heterochromatin, um, and then the uh, regions of the chromatin that were uh, less dense or took up less of the dye, these are the so-called euchromatin regions. And of course we know now that the euchromatin regions are where the genes are, uh, are present uh, and where the, the majority of uh, transcription occurs. So if, uh, a few years afterwards, in fact this is only a year afterwards, um, these are some of the first studies looking at um, position effect variegation. And really I, I wanted to point this out was this is really the first discovery of the fact that the but the heterochromatin is not a static um, unit, right? It's not, the heterochromatin isn't there and, and, and doesn't change, but it actually is a dynamic unit. And this was shown through these translocation experiments where when uh, this gene was placed near this boundary of a heterochromatic element, it would be silenced in a non-Mendelian way, suggesting that the heterochromatin itself is dynamic. So of course, um, hopefully most of you are familiar with uh, Conrad Waddington's work. Again, this is a few years later, but this, of course, is before we knew that DNA was a hereditary, uh, the hereditary uh, uh, unit. And Conrad um, coined this term in 1942, um, and uh, he coined it in the context of understanding how genotype gives rise to phenotype. In this particular case, he was studying uh, fly wing development, but suggesting how does uh, different genotypes give rise to the same, or how does different um, the same genotype give rise to different phenotypes, and he coined this term the uh, epigenotype, which of course um, uh, was then developed further into uh, the epigenome. So shortly thereafter, um, of course, uh, famous experiments by Avery McLeod and McCarthy actually showed that DNA uh, was the um, hereditary uh, element, so it was in fact DNA where phenotype could be, uh, could to, could be transferred. So now we understand that there's DNA, we understand that there's this heterochromatin and these euchromatin compartments, um, but uh, we still haven't figured out or we still have no real understanding of the epigenetic mechanisms. So just a few years later, in fact, looking through these uh, TLC, um, so looking at this thin layer chromatography, uh, it was observed that, of course, the, the, the four main bases are here. Uh, so we have uh, guanine, cytosine, adenine, and thymine. Um, but there was this other um, uh, component making up, you know, a few percentage of the DNA, which was, which was named epicytosine, okay? So it ran near cytosine in the TLC, uh, but, it was, but it was called epicytosine. And actually, looking at this epicytosine, this is the actual uh, publication from 1948, and you can see that they conjectured or they hypothesized that this epicytosine was actually 5-methylcytosine. And this was through uh, studies of bacterial DNA, looking in particular TB, uh, which showed that they had a similar, a similar size. So, so now we have an understanding that there's the four main bases. We know that these bases are the, are the, are the context of hereditary material, but now we actually understand that, that some of these bases can be chemically modified, and we think that this chemical modification is DNA methylation. So moving a little bit further in time, now we're in, up to 1951. Of course, Barbara McClintock uh, famously discovered uh, these discrete elements of the genome, so-called transposable elements that have regulatory potential. So these are these elements, these uh, regulatory elements uh, that we, of course, study quite extensively now using epigenomic uh, tools, <coughs> such as CHIP-seq, looking at marks such as K27 acetylation. But these discrete elements could jump around the genome, and where, wherever they laid, they could actually regulate the gene uh, that was nearby. So this concept that there are these discrete regulatory elements that we can move around the genome, and we can measure these, and these can then um, uh, regulate uh, nearby genes. Um, 
A few years later, the discovery of X inactivation, hopefully everyone in this room is familiar with dosage compensation in females, in the context that, of course, females have two X chromosomes and one of them must be silenced. And Mary Leon uh, did the, the fundamental work and, in fact, originally posited that this uh, X chromosome inactivation occurred uh, and, was, uh, and, and uh, was mediated through epigenetic mechanisms. Okay, so now we know that there's DNA methylation, that DNA methylation can control uh, gene expression. But what is it that DNA methylation is doing in the genome, and, and, and what, is its, what is its role in, in normal differentiation? And so there are a number of papers, and now we're up to 1975, 1980, really looking at um, how DNA methylation, or, or positing or hypothesizing what the role of DNA methylation might be. Um, so DNA modification um, affects gene activity during development. And this is where the first concepts really emerged, suggesting that DNA methylation was playing a role in controlling differentiation, really controlling how genes are being transcribed as we differentiate from a totipotent um, uh, zygote all the way through to a terminally differentiated cell, and suggesting that DNA methylation in particular was playing a role in this, uh, in this mechanism. Um, around this time, uh, pioneering work from uh, uh, Peter Jones and Stephen Balin and, and a number of others showed that a cytotoxic, uh, a, G, a drug that was originally developed in the 50s as a chemotherapeutic, which, which was highly toxic, um, so-called 5-azocytidine, but at, at, but at limited doses, if you added it to culture, in, into cells at, at, a, at a very dilute uh, concentration, could actually drive those cells to differentiate. So this was very, of course, very surprising and again supported this concept that somehow epigenetic mechanisms were playing a role in mediating differentiation. Okay, so that's kind of the, the overview of DNA methylation to our, to, uh, towards the concepts of, 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 um, of uh, uh, differentiation. And now I'm just going to bring us all the way up to date and, and give you an overview of what we understand about DNA methylation as a sort of primer for the rest of, of, rest of the course. So this is a, a review in Nature by Dirk Schubler, uh, if you, those are interested. So the first thing I want to point out is that CPGs um, themselves are unevenly distributed in mammalian genomes. And, and everybody, I, I'm assuming, knows this. Do, do people know why this is? Why are, why are CPGs unevenly distributed? I'm sure some of you know. <laughs> Sarah has to answer in the back. Well, some of them are really rich in promoters. I think one of the slides was that they have um, tend to be associated with promotion by gene regulation. Right, but but so why but why are they enriched in promoters, I guess it's like to have that layer of function control in the DNA methylation. Right. But from an evolutionary perspective, it's it's through this mechanism of deamination, right? So, so these so-called CPG islands, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, are actually just remnants of the ancestral genome, right? It's not that it's not that CPGs collected at promoters. It's just that the rest of the CPGs in the genome have slowly degraded away, and they've degraded through spontaneous deamination. Where when we lose, when we deaminate 5-methylcytosine, it becomes thymidine. It's not recognized as a, as a base error by the base excision repair mechanism. And if it's not under selective pressure, it's essentially lost. And so the concept is that these CPG islands, these so-called you know, dense or CPG-rich regions, are actually remnants of the ancestral genome that are under selective pressure. And we think they're under selective pressure because they're actually playing a role in, in as, as Sarah pointed out, in regulating the genes. So that's one concept to, to, to understand. The majority of CPGs in mammalian genomes, I work in mammalian genomes, um, so the majority of CPGs are methylated. Uh, this is uh, not true of all organisms, but certainly true of, of uh, a mammalian. Um, and there's an overall decrease correlated with differentiation in particular cellular context. So this has been studied quite extensively in hemopoietic differentiation, an area that I work in, and we know that, for example, in B-cell differentiation, we lose methylation globally. This is also a characteristic of disease states, like malignant genomes. We know that we lose methylation uh, genome-wide. However, paradoxically, we also gain methylation within CPG promoters, and I, I know Guillaume will uh, be talking about that a little bit more. Dogmatically, if you look in textbooks, we, we think about DNA methylation as being a repressive mark, right? And when we study it and when we do bioinformatic analysis on DNA methylation, we're always 
I mean, you, you can read n numerous papers that say, okay, I found a CPG that's methylated uh, in blood of these, uh, you know, of these hundred uh, infants and uh, it's nearby this gene X, therefore this gene must be uh, repressed by the presence of this methylation. But it's important to note that DNA methylation is context specific. Gene bodies themselves are methylated, right? So if a, if a methylation is found within a gene body, that's probably more likely uh, representative of, of an actively transcribed gene rather than a repressed gene. So you cannot simply say that because you found a methylated CPG nearby a gene that that gene is, is repressed. And that's an important concept uh, to understand. And the mechanisms by, with this, by which this occurs are fairly well known. It actually goes through an intermediate step of histone methylation, H3K36 trimethylation, as I'll talk about in a minute. Um, most CPG islands, these are the so-called, these are these ancestral um, remnants of, of, the, um, of the CPG density of the genome, are unmethylated. So the vast majority of these are unmethylated in normal genomes. Um, and uh, when they become methylated, however, CPG islands are repressed. Now this, I think, is a, a good figure to, to get into a little bit more uh, detail. Um, so again, when we look at a mammalian genome shown here, a vertebrate genome, the majority of the genome is methylated. Um, and of course, actively transcribed gene bodies are methylated. CPG islands tend to be unmethylated, um, but uh, in front of an inactive gene. So these are uh, unmethylated. Um, and importantly, regulatory elements, and in particular enhancer elements, and this is something that I think many of you are probably interested in studying, regulatory elements are unmethylated or hypomethylated. And this is actually very powerful, um, something we use in the lab a lot uh, to try and understand regulatory states just looking at DNA methylation. So you can look at just DNA methylation and predict active regulatory states looking at their methylation state. Okay. So another, another important thing, so that's kind of an, an overview of methylation, but I just wanted to point out, and I'm, hopefully everyone is aware, that DNA methylation itself uh, has been selectively lost in a number of, of species, including a number of model organisms, right? So DNA methylation itself is not required for life. It's not required for multicellular differentiation. We can lose it and things seem to be fine. In fact, even in a, in a mouse uh, embryonic stem cell, we can knock out all methylation and the cell will exist perfectly, the cell can proliferate or can grow perfectly well until such time as we induce it to differentiate. As soon as we induce it to differentiate, the cell dies. So methylation is not required for, for, for cellular maintenance, has been lost in a number of organisms, including such things as C. elegans. Um, but in the context of a million cells, if we knock it out, uh, the cell dies. Okay, so that's DNA methylation in, in a very, very uh, high level overview. So of course, um, the other major component or another major component of epigenomic um, uh, regulation uh, is histone modification. Um, and this was, uh, the, this is the crystal structure of the um, nucleosome in which you can see the histones, which are colored here. Um, and importantly, what you can see is these long N-terminal tails uh, sticking out of the nucleosomes. And of course, we, know, we now know that it's these long N-terminal tails, for the, for the most part, um, that can be decorated with chemical um, uh, uh, modifications. In fact, we know that there's more than 100 different chemical modifications, or at least, uh, at least 100 different chemical modifications have been observed by mass spec. We only study a very small subset of those using chip sequencing, and I, I hope I will, I will show you um, why we think that's appropriate in, in a few slides. So um, now going back to a little bit of the history, well, how did we find out that these chemical modifications exist, and, and how do we know that they're, that they're linked to uh, changes in gene expression? So going um, you know, back to uh, 1964, where the first observations of, in fact, acetylation, so acetylation is one type of chemical modification that can occur. Um, the, the, the first studies associating acetylation and active gene transcription were made. Of course, back in 64 and even in, in 78, um, we thought that these chemical modifications were more structural. We didn't, we didn't have the concept of uh, them being uh, actively regulated or dynamic in the sense that we understand them to be today. 
Um, I don't know why I showed this. Okay, I think this is slightly. This is out of. This is. I should have been the slide before. I don't know. Scott got a little bit out of uh, uh, out of um, order. But just to, just to remember everyone that of course DNA methylation and epigenetic mechanisms in general um, go through uh, reprogramming twice uh, in in uh, in the uh, in the organisms. Um, uh, life uh, once uh, during uh, uh, primordial germ cell um, development, and then again uh, just after fertilization. And of course, this has become um, somewhat controversial: is that in the context of this epigenomic reprogramming, repro pro how can we get such things as transgenerational inheritance? And I know many of you in the room uh, study this very extensively, so I'm not going to embarrass myself by talking any more about it. Um, but just to just to get back to the histone code, so. Um, David Alice um, uh, famously showed, and this is in a, an organism, tetrahymenin, which is a, a be makes beautiful pictures, um, but basically showed the mechanism of, uh, or was the first to show the mechanism of how this histone acetyltransferase acetylated uh, nu uh, histones um, through recruitment by Paul II, and this acted to reinforce active transcriptional states. So this is really our first understanding of how acetylation was linked to, um, uh, to active transcription. Uh, but of course, this was in, in the, more in the context of, of consequence versus cause. So really, the acetylation was occurring, but it was occurring as a consequence of transcription uh, rather than encoding uh, information itself. OK, so, so moving a few years uh, forward now uh, to, to bring us sort of up to date, um, here are a series of uh, histone um, modifications that are actively studied uh, in, in the lab. And of course, these will be ones that we, we talk about today. Um, and so we can broadly group these histone modifications first into those that are activating, such as acetylation, and this is where it was first studied, um, and those that are associated with repressive or heterochromatic states. Okay, So just for those of you who are unfamiliar with the nomenclature, this is the, 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 the nomenclature of how we um, uh, read these. So the first uh, characters are the histone. So this is histone H3. Then we have lysine 4. So remember that it's the N-terminal tail. So we're counting in. This is the fourth lysine on the N-terminal tail. And then we have the modification itself. In this particular case, trimethylation. Okay. That's review for most of you. Trimethylation. Here's monomethylation. Uh, here's another mark, K27. So the 27th lysine from the N-terminal tail. This is acetylated. And what I want you to notice, of course, is that depending on the, not only the type of modification, but the amount of modification, you can encode different information. So the way we understand it is that H3K4 monomethylation is a mark of, of enhancer states. Um, and you might have heard the term primed enhancers. This is a terminology that's, that's emerged out of, primarily out of studying hemopoietic differentiation, but it seems to apply to other tissues as well. We have other marks, such as H3K27 acetylation, um, which marks active enhancers. I already talked briefly about this mark, H3K36 trimethylation, which is um, uh, associated with uh, actively elongating transcription, and K4 trimethylation, which marks active promoters. Um, we also have repressive chromatin, and here we have the same position on the same histone, um, but uh, it is um, trimethylated as opposed to acetylated. And that changes that state from an active state to a press state. And of course, we also know that these marks don't act on their own. They actually act together um, in the so-called histone code. This is a terminology that David Alice, again, uh, coined. And, and, and you know, we know that we can get cases where we have both active states and repressive states coexisting together uh, in, in promoters the so-called bivalent promoter that hopefully some of you have been, uh, some of you are familiar with. This was work initially by Brad Bernstein looking at mouse embryonic stem cells back in 2006, who showed that there are a whole set of promoters that are marked both with an active and a repressive state. Uh, in that particular case, those genes are transcriptionally inert in the ES cell. Um, and then this, there's this so-called resolution of the bivalent state as the cell differentiates. And in fact, it's these bivalent promoters turn out to be very um, important, not only for normal differentiation, but these also tend to be the promoters that are deregulated as a consequence of disease, and in particular, in malignancies. OK, so why do we study? So 
So I told you that there's a hundred different modifications, and I'm showing you six here. This six end up, these six um, are an important set, an important subset that were initially selected as part of um, a program called the NIH Reference Epigenome Program. Some of you might be familiar with that, something that I was involved in for a number of years, which was a founding member of something called the International Human Epigenome Consortium. And back in 2008, when the NIH Roadmap Program started, I remember being at the meeting in DC, and the question was, what is a reference epigenome? How do you define a reference epigenome? And at that time, ENCODE was just starting up, um, Manolis Kellis, Jason Ernst, and a number of others were trying to ask this question, if there are hundreds of different modifications, how can we even begin to study them? And so the concept of defining this set of reference, of this, this set of um, uh, uh, modifications, which is now the set that's really used, is the set that you will come across most often in the literature, and in fact most data sets um, uh, contain one or more of these particular modifications. This really comes from the concept that if we look across many different modifications, and here I'm showing you a whole set of different acetylations and methylations, that in fact, there's a lot of redundancy in the histone code. And so that set of six modifications was selected as ones that best represented the diversity of chromatin states that could be obtained by doing as many of these modifications as possible. So this was work, um, the, this, this set of, of modifications was done by Bing Ren's group um, uh, in, in ES cells, really saying, well, if we look at all of these different modifications, what more can we learn? And, and what we learned was that many of these modifications are, in fact, highly redundant. If we know one of them, um, we can be pretty certain that we know what the other ones might be. But that kind of leaves open the question, why are these all these modifications there? What is the cell doing with them? And those are kind of, those are still open questions in the field. It's not clear what this redundancy is, is doing. It's not clear whether the, some of these other marks, and it's probably likely that some of these other marks are specific for states that we perhaps don't understand uh, as of yet. But that's how this set of six marks was selected. And this has really become the, the kind of reference set of histone marks that are used uh, 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 in the field currently. So just to sort of end that component or the introduction, maybe just to, to make the comments, you know, what are the major questions in the field? And I think we could probably argue, argue this uh, amongst, and maybe we can have a discussion at the coffee break. But really, cause versus consequence of epigenetic modification is something that comes up a lot. So if we have that modification there, is that modification actually encoding information, or is it just a consequence of some other regulatory state? And the easiest one to kind of think about is H3K36 trimethylation. We know that's being recruited by, we know that's being laid down as the polymerase is, is, is traversing across the gene. Um, so is that a cause or a consequence, right? Sounds more like a, like a consequence than a cause. And one can make the same argument across uh, many histone mods. So I think that's, that's one major question in the field. And then secondarily, the scope and mechanisms of transgenerational inheritance. I showed you that DNA methylation is reset during development. So that sort of opens the question, well, if that's true, then how can we have transgenerational inheritance of epigenetic modifications? And again, I'd be happy to discuss it um, over coffee. OK, so that's kind of the overview of epigenomics. And now I'm going to start getting into the bioinformatics of things. So first of all, as I mentioned, um, it's really massively parallel sequencing that underpins the vast majority of epigenomic assays. Um, so um, hopefully many of you are familiar with um, the, the four sets that are shown here. Um, so looking at DNA methylation um, analysis, um, and many of you, when we went around the room, talked about sodium bisulfite sequencing. That's, of course, one way of measuring DNA methylation. We can also use immunoprecipitation strategies, so-called MEDIF sequencing, or the hydroxymethylated version, hydroxymethylated um, sequencing. Um, so those are ways that we can measure um, methylation genome-wide. Of course, ChIP-seq um, is, is another methodology, and I'm going to go into this a little bit more detail. Um, uh, open, open chromatin regions, so looking at regions of the genome that are open, um, which are uh, available for transcription factor or regulatory state binding. Um, we can measure those by just using simple digestion strategies and, again, building libraries, sequencing them, and aligning them to the genome. And more recently, three-dimensional strategies, 
Of course, we know that the genome is not a linear molecule in the nucleus, but it's actually compacted and, and packaged in a very, uh, very tightly regulated way. And this three-dimensional structure itself can be informative in many different ways, although I don't think we're going to get into that uh, in, in, in the next couple of days. Um, but that's another technology, that's another um, uh, modality that can be, uh, that can be looked at using NGS platforms. Okay. So how do we do chip sequencing? How am I doing? Oh, I lost How do we do chip sequencing? So um, this is a very basic overview. Again, hopefully this is a review for most of you. Of course, we have the genome where we have a bunch of histones, and these histones can be, can be modified in some way. The first step in, in chip sequencing is to shear uh, the, the DNA. And there's two main ways to do this. One, using an enzymatic um, process, usually MNAs, although there are other uh, enzymes that are used. Um, so MNAs digesting the genome. Another way to do it is to use sonication, so just cavitation to actually shear the, the DNA. Shears a single strand at a time to generate a series of fragments. More recently, technologies have been developed using transposons, which actually insert between the, the histones, so-called iChip and, and flavors of that uh, have also been developed. But fundamentally, what we're trying to do is, is break the genome into chunks and these chunks, of course, are the size of DNA that we can sequence on a massively parallel sequencing platform, right? So the reason we're doing this is just so we can have a fragment that we can then build a library from and sequence. So we, we break the genome up. We then use antibodies that target a particular modification. In this case, in this cartoon example, it's an uh, antibody against H3K4 trimethylation. We immunoprecipitate that material. And then we strip all the protein away, and we're just left with our double-stranded DNA. Of course, depending on the type of shearing you used, you may need to end repair. You may need to clean up the ends if you've got ragged um, ends of the double-stranded DNA. Uh, add adapters to it, um, sequence it, um, and then uh, align it to the genome, as we're going to get into. So what are some key considerations for doing um, epigenomic assays? Well, one of the first ones is antibody specificity and sensitivity. Do not overlook this if you do this experiment. And if you're analyzing data, this is something that's worth spending time, right? What antibody was used and what evidence do you have that that antibody actually recognizes the epitope that you're looking at um, and doesn't recognize others? Um, this remains a very, this remains a, a, a significant challenge in the field. I can say for our own uh, group here in, in Vancouver, um, we spend more money and time validating antibodies than we do purchasing them. Um, so it, it will take us, um, well, it, so just to give you an idea that there are a, a number of antibodies out there that are commercially available that do not pass um, just a standard validation. Um, of what's the specificity, what's the sensitivity. So if you're going to start an experimental design where you're using chip sequencing, please spend the time to understand the, sense, the specificity of, of the antibody. I'm going to go through that in a little bit more. Another question that you ask is, which marks should I profile? Well, it depends on the question that you're asking, of course. If you're looking at regulatory states, um, K27 acetylation is a, is a very um, <clears throat> popular, uh, popular choice. Um, I could say that if I had a limited budget and I couldn't do all six, you know, what are the, what are the sets that people typically do? That would be H3K4 trimethylation to mark promoters, polycomb H3K27 trimethylation for the reasons that I outlined, and then H3K27 acetylation to mark enhancer states. That's a common set that people will use, and then you can add others to it uh, on, on top, but that's a, that's a, a nice core set to begin with. And then a question I get all the time, and I'm sure you guys have heard of, have, get this as well, is how much should I sequence? How deeply should I sequence? And again, that depends on the mark that you're using. What I'm showing you here are uh, recommendations that have come out of the assay standards working group of the International Human Epigenome Consortium, um, which suggests that 50 million read pairs, so 50 million read pairs, which is 25 million fragments, right? Remember, now we're going to be, and I'm going to get into this in a little bit more detail, but of course, when we sequence on, when we sequence what we immunoprecipitate, we can sequence from either end. Those are read pairs. We're sequencing one fragment. So 50 million reads, 25 million read fragments. For broader marks, such as H3K9 trimethylation, primarily marks heterochromatin regions, 
can occupy a vast expanse of the genome, we, uh, we suggest more, 100 million read pairs. So it's probably significantly more than, than some of you have seen in the literature, um, but this is based on uh, uh, subsampling and, and really um, trying to uh, make a good balance between uh, budget and uh, sensitivity uh, of the assay. And, and some would argue that perhaps even more than 100 million reads would be required to, uh, to appropriately profile canine try. Okay, so garbage in, garbage out. If you've got garbage antibody and you do immunoprecipitation and you look at the data, the data is not going to be useful. So do take the time to look at the, at the um, specificity of the antibody. This is data that we published through uh, the, the, the CERC or the Canadian Epigenetics and Environment Health Research Consortium Mapping Center that I run here in Vancouver. So we, we published it. This is, the, this is the, our QC um, that we run for all our antibodies. We use a 384 uh, peptide array uh, to actually look at the specificity, calculate the specificity of the target peptide over the other um, uh, peptides on the array. We do a Western blot, and if it's a new catalog number, um, we will then do a CHIP-seq experiment, actually sequence it, and then compare it back uh, to existing data. We do that for every new uh, cat and lot number that we get um, from, <clears throat> from, a, from a commercial entity. Um, and even if you have the same catalog number in different lot numbers, that could be a completely new antibody, right? There's no, the catalog number has no, rep, no, um, uh, no bearing on, on what, the, what the antibody is itself. Um, this is just another example. Um, this is H3K27 acetylation. Acetylated antibodies tend to be the most difficult to validate um, and are the most challenging to obtain a high quality antibody for. Um, again, I'd be happy to discuss the details of this uh, in, uh, over the break. Yeah. You're not allowed to ask, no. <laughs> uh, so, do you need, so if you have, do you need to, how stable is it? So do you, do you need to retest them or do they stay good forever? So, so when we bring them in, we then aliquot them and snap and freeze them or, or store them at four degrees. So we, we essentially have working stocks. Um, and how stable it is, I mean, it's, a, it's stable for at least a year. Um, we validate every, we will redo the validation, at least from the chip seek, once a year if we have a, a sufficient stock, but it's a good point. So you will see some degradation in the, specific, in the sensitivity over time. Specificity is, is fairly stable, um, as, as one might expect. Um, okay. So now let, we're going to get into a little bit of the, of, or we're going to get into the bioinformatics side of things. Um, so uh, this is a kind of cartoon of how one might think about uh, chip seek processing. Um, and there's two modules here. Module one, which is where we'll start with, which is really looking from, looking at the the, the base calls and quality of the data that's emerged from the from the sequencing platform. And you guys are going to run FastQC to actually do that on chip seek data in module one. Um, module two then takes that fast QC data uh, and generates um, alignments to the reference genome, and the standard file output of that is called the BAM file. So a BAM file is essentially those reads aligned to the reference genome, um, and it's, it provides you a series of uh, probabilities of the quality of the alignment, as Misha will discuss in detail, um, and where that alignment is on the genome. The output of the BAM file is the WIG file. So a WIG file is a compressed version of that, um, which is usually the file type that you will then go on and do your analysis with. So run your R packages on or, or associate with genes. So these are the main four. FastQs, raw file, BAM is the alignments, WIG is, the, is a uh, file format that encodes uh, a compressed version of that aligned to the genome. And then of course there's, you know, uh, you know numerous different ways to then take that data, integrate it, visualize, uh, and do analysis. Okay. So now I'm going to go through the basics of the sequencing. Hopefully, maybe this is review for some of you, um, but this is essentially um, the, the, uh, how the, the sequencing is generated from these fragments. So we start again from our DNA. We shear it to random fragments. Of course, N NGS data doesn't really care. This could be anything. Um, in this case, of course, we, we're doing um, chip sequencing. We end repair uh, and add um, uh, DNA sequences of known sequence, these red and, red and green uh, tags on the end. Um, and then we 
PCR Amplify to generate uh, a library that's ready for sequencing. So it's got, now it's got this yellow and orange tag uh, that, that allows us to, to generate um, clusters on a, on a sequencing platform. So how does the actual sequencing work? So this is a cartoon from a number of years ago, uh, but the basic principles haven't changed. Yeah, yeah. So is it possible if I have hypothesis that come you know, like with the with the you know DNA shear and sequencing them uh, using the you know this foligation and I use the uh, hypochromic for you know like gate length trivalidation or twenty seven trivalidation, I use the enzyme one. Yeah. Can you actually come like <laughs> bring them together? Yeah, so now we're so that's a great question. So what we've seen is that you'll get clustering based on the technology. So we actually see subclusters emerge um, that are MNAs. So if we take a, a set of data, we say we have 50 chip seq experiments, and then we have some subset that's cross-linked and sheared, and some that's MNAs. You will get um, patterns that are, um, or you'll get subclusters based on the technology. Um, that said, I had a co-op student who worked, you know, six months trying to define you know, standards of what those, you know, it, it isn't predictable in any way, um, but it is something certainly to be aware of. Um, there are many regions where you're going to get readouts that are the same. Um, so an overall correlation is about 0 0.9, 0 0.92 between ChIP-seq and MNAs uh, ChIP-seq. And what you see is that there are regions that MNAs reaches into uniquely, and those are the ones that will tend to cluster that group together. Um, and there, there are regions that cross-linking will, will reach into uniquely. So you get unique regions, the majority of it is shared, but when you're doing clustering and you're looking for one or two percent difference between samples, it's actually going to drive a difference. And so you, you certainly need to, need to be aware of that. Yeah? Is that because of the confirmation of the DNA with the Yeah, I mean, I could hypothesize. It's certainly, it's reaching into areas, it's reaching into different areas. Why that might be, uh, I don't know. Uh, but it, it probably has something to do with the density or availability of that, that region to, uh, to be either sheared or, or digested with MNAs. But it is important to keep in mind. Yeah? Does, does it mean that all the way it starts at the same site? No, no, they don't. No, so it, it, it's chewing at the ends of the open. Well, you know, the, at least we, the way we think about it is that we've got a nucleosome. Um, you know, you've got a nucleosome, a nucleosome, and you've got DNA. So it's chewing, you know, in between. But it, it isn't just in one spot. It can chew all the way in, uh, on either way. And in fact, we published a. So so, not not to spend too much time on this. But, but what we found is that when we do MNAs digestion and then immunoprecipitate, and then we align those fragments to the genome, we can actually see different lengths depending on the type of, of, uh, um, of um, uh, target we use. So for example, for K27 trimethylation, even though when we look at the, the size distribution of the input, let's say it looks like this, and this is say 200 base pairs, after we do the IP, we actually see a shift in size. And, and even though the input is all the same size, we're actually enriching for two nucleosome components, probably because you know, the affinity of the antibody is such that we're actually pulling down these. So we see this, whereas if we look at H3K4 trimethylation, which marks active promoters, um, we, we, we see a majority of, of it at, at the input size. So there's, there's a lot of you know, nuances in, in the experimental side of things. And, it's, and as much as you can learn about that when you're doing your analysis is, 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 is important, yeah. Okay, so great question, so, so moving on. So how do we actually do the sequencing? Um, so again, we start with these DNA fragments that could be MNAs digested, they could be cross-linked, or more recently, they can also be transposon tagged. Of course, the transposons add the purple and blue uh, segments on the ends uh, as part of the transpo transposition process. Um, we then flow those over a, um, uh, we flow those over a flow cell. This was animated at one point, but uh, because it's a PDF, it's, it's no longer animated. But essentially, on the flow cell surface, we have um, oligos that are grafted to the glass, 
that hybridize to either the blue or the purple. Okay, so when we flow these um, these DNA fragments over the surface of the flow cell, we actually get a hybridization between either the purple or the blue. Right? So maybe I'll just draw it. Can I erase this or no? Is it okay to erase this? Okay. <clears throat> So flow cell surface, we have, um, I'm just going to use one color for the sake of argument, but essentially we get, we flow our, um, our uh, DNA fragments over. This is um, three prime, this is five prime to three prime. Um, this is five prime here. And essentially we, we get this hybridization effect where we get hybridization, which then forms a priming event. Okay, so that's what's important. The priming event occurs, and then we're able to uh, extend uh, this one strand. And there's uh, a complementary oligo um, for the other end, the five prime end of this, which then falls over, and you can kind of see that in this compressed version here. So you see this kind of bending over event that occurs. Okay, this is the so called bridge amplification, because essentially you get this event, but this occurs, you get bridge amplification, you get this event here where you've got hybridization here. Right? So that, that forms the first strand. We then denature that, repeat that process over and over and over again to generate clonal copies of that one DNA molecule um, in a location on the flow cell. So that's how Illumina sequencing works. The other primary way of doing this is on beads, so such a, um, something, um, so the Life Technologies uh, platform, um, or uh, 454, for those of you who, who remember that platform where instead of doing it on a solid surface, we actually do it on, the, on, the, on a bead. And so we have a bead, but the concept is exactly the same. That's been decorated in, in oligos. And to generate these individual reactions, instead of partitioning on the flow cell surface, we actually partition in an oil-water mixture to, to form these micro-reactors, right? I um, mean, the challenge there, of course, is that we have to use Poisson to actually get one bead one strand of DNA inside each inside some subset of, of the number of microreactors, which means we have to use a lot more volume, which is one of the reasons why um, these types of technologies have not really caught on to the degree that, for example, Illumina has, where we've got this solid state surface. Now, the original Illumina platforms up until um, just a few years ago actually used random, dis uh, dis um, random placement of these um, oligos on the, on the glass surface. And so you've got this random pattern of, of uh, so-called clusters um, on the, of the flow cell surface. And more recently, and some of you might be aware of the, the more, so the HiSeq 4000 or the HiSeq X platform that uses a, um, an ordered array. So it's actually, so now the oligos are placed in, a, in an order on the flow cell surface. And this has led to some problems bioinformatically where we're getting where we're getting read through from uh, adjacent, um, uh, adjacent uh, clusters on the flow cell surface, something we call optical duplicates. Um, and this you will see um, as, as, a, as, as one of the outputs of the QC of the run. If you've got a high number of optical duplicates, you've got a problem with your run, and I'll, I'll go through how that happens in just a minute. Okay, so again, um, this was an animated, but just we can go through it. So essentially, once you've generated the clusters, the sequencing itself works like this. We start by adding a primer. In this case, the primer is five prime to three prime. We then add the nucleotides, which are labeled, um, into the mix. This then uh, incorporates the first nucleotide, and of course, the technology that Illumina became, um, well, that Illumina has really based its sequencing platforms on is the uh, reversible terminator. So dideoxy sequencing, Sanger sequencing, of course, uses a terminator that basically it's lost the three prime hydroxy group, so it cannot extend any further. The, 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 the breakthrough in terms of Illumina is the fact that they use a reversible terminator. So once that's incorporated, you can remove that. Uh, once it's incorporated, you wash everything else away, shine a laser on that particular um, uh, we'll shine a laser on the flow cell surface, take an image, um, and then re reverse the terminator, add the next nucleotide, and so on, and so on, and so on. So that's sequence by synthesis. We're doing it on, on the flow cell surface on a set of clusters that 
right? So we've got our flow cell surface, we've got our clusters um, that are formed, and we're sequencing them uh, one at a time uh, using the sequence by synthesis technology. Okay, um, so how does how does the actual uh, sequence? Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. Say that again. Sorry. Dark cycles. Dark cycles. So now you're talking about. Um, so on some platforms, on in particular the the next seek, which is a which is a, a relatively recent platform from Illumina, they've eliminated one of the. Um, they've changed the chemistry, so there's actually only two or three um, signals that are determined, and one they determined by the lack of a signal, so-called dark cycle. So I'll get maybe I'll, when I go through this. So when you, when you talk about let, maybe I'll go through this and then I can maybe explain what the dark cycle is. But but essentially, so how we how we actually convert. Um, this information into a sequence string is shown here. So we start with our first, um, uh, our first image, and this first image, and in fact it's the first 25 images, generates something called the focal map. Okay? The focal map is, is important. It, it's how the sequences become named, and, and it's actually how we relate read one to read two. So the focal map essentially takes, um, so now we're going to look at the flow cell surface this way. So now we're looking, um, we're looking this way on the flow cell surface. So when we, we break the flow cell into tiles, uh, so the flow cell has a bunch of lanes. Um, the lanes themselves can be broken into tiles. And within these tiles, we have a bunch of sequences that are being generated. Right? And initially, this was random. More recently, on the 4,000 and next, and uh, high and X platforms, these are ordered arrays. So the arrays, we actually know what the position is, but the concept is exactly the same. So we take this lane, let's say this is lane one, of course lane two is here, lane three, most, well I shouldn't say that, but a typical flow cell has eight lanes, although there's various configurations now, it doesn't really matter. But we take this tile and we break it into X and Y, right? So we have X, Y coordinates, and the focal map essentially assigns for every position that it's getting a signal for, it'll assign a, uh, an XY position for that cluster, okay? And as I'll show you, that XY position becomes encoded in the sequence name and is how we keep the sequences straight throughout the rest of the bioinformatic process. If you don't have the XY coordinates, you have no idea how to relate one read to the other read. And the sequencing is done independently, so we do read one first, then we do our index read, and then we do read two, and we do our index read, and we can talk about the details of that. Again, all of that is, is um, bound together by these XY coordinates. So the XY coordinates uniquely identify that sequence on the flow cell surface and allows us to, to know that read one and read two are related to one another, or know that read one and the index is related to each other. So the focal map is a critical component of generating the sequence. Now, when we, when we sequence some types of libraries, not usually a, a problem for epigenomic libraries, but if you have a library that has a low diversity, so for example, Amplicon libraries, this can cause a problem in generating the focal map because we have one base that essentially overwhelms the camera um, because it's, let's say, it's all A's on the first base of incorporation. It overwhelms the camera and it cannot generate the focal map. That's why, you, maybe some of you are aware, we spike things in, like phi x. We spike phi x in to provide that diversity to allow it to uh, assign a position to the x and y coordinates, okay? So once we've assigned the x and y coordinates, as is shown in that first image, um, we then essentially, you can think of it as a stack of images. We then walk through this stack of images, essentially looking to see what base was in, what, what fluorescent signal comes off of that base at each of the cycles? Cycle one, cycle two, cycle three, cycle four. So you can just see there's a T, 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 T. I can't see that. G, T. Right? So it's in, once it's generated the focal map, then we simply step through each of those images, looking at that X, Y position, recording what the, what the intensity is that, that emerges from it, um, and then we convert that into either a T or a G. Now, dark cycles are when, when we incorporate, um, and I don't remember which base it is that's the dark cycle, um, but when you incorporate that, you, you essentially don't get any signal. 
and you and you uh, you um, interpret that as being the base that is is encoded within the dark cycle. Um, as far as I know, that has no um, negative consequences in terms of the quality. Um, we, I mean, I don't know. I don't know if Guillaume uses uh, NextSeq for whole genome bisulfite. There has been some suggestion that there might be some quality concerns with whole genome bisulfite data, um, but uh, we don't. We haven't seen that, um, although we don't use it um, that um, frequently. Typically, we, we're doing whole genome on uh, X platform now. Um, yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. So you're refining it, you're refining the focal map over the first 25. The first generations of the selexes, it was like the first five images I think it used. Maybe the first one was probably the first image. But it, but but they found that the that the quality of the of the position, as you as you can expect, I mean these things have different sizes. Some of them are some of them are closer to one another than others. You get you get bleed through. You, know, you see that this one's a big one, but you got these little small ones over here. So there's a lot of little nuances that occur in generation of the focal map. Why you Why not just see Completely it? empirically. Good point. Yes. Question? Uh, how does it work in, in, in Jeffy? Like in the ones of our range or in the one that have some white? How does it work in the uh, So you're talking about here? Yeah, it's mixing and the color is kind of. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about that in a second. So how? So why is it that we can only read 100 bases? So that, that gets into something called phasing and pre-phasing, which is one of the failure modalities. And, and, and hopefully that will become apparent um, uh, as we go through that. But yes, you, obviously, biology is not black and white. Um, there, there are misincorporations, and, and the chemistry itself uh, can be problematic. And, and I'll talk about that in a minute. I just wanted to just spend very, very briefly just to remind you that we can also do paradan reads, right? So many of you are familiar with paradan reads. Certainly for chip seek data, paradan data has significant advantages over single end data, although you might be using single end data. With paradan data, we can actually predict, or we not predict, we know the size of the fragments, as I think Misha will talk about. That provides some additional um, power in the analysis downstream, but you can also do single end. Hopefully everybody's familiar. Is everybody familiar with what a paradigm read is? Do I need to go through this? No. Everyone knows, right? We're reading in from either end of the fragment. But just to, just to remind you that that's actually happening by actually after we do our, our first uh, round of uh, sequencing, we actually regenerate the cluster, but going the other way now. And that's what gives us the, the other, um, other end. So we're actually... We do the cluster generation the first time, we clip one end, we block, and then we can extend, and that's read one, and we do it the other way. Yeah? Um, I just wanted to confirm something. So if you're doing a really low chip, for example, on 200, and you want to sell off in those you paradigm reads, right? Mm -hmm. Then you can use the rational alignment because you get more mathematical reads. So the, the, well, again, Michel, so the, the number, the actual increase in mappability <laughs> is about 2% uh, in a mammalian right. genome. So it's it's not a, it's not a huge increase. Um, so remember, as you as we'll go through the reads are played. Well, I, I won't steal Misha's thunder, but it's about two percent increase in mappability. But what it does allow you to do is know what the fragment size is. So when you do single end reads, you you can computationally predict what the size of the fragment is that you're sequencing or that you've sequenced. But when you read both ends, then you know where the stop and ends are. And if we know that. We're dealing with a nucleosome. We can actually use we can use that information uh, in our in our analysis um, as 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 we'll go through. Can I ask you one yeah. One? Yeah. Sorry. So I guess if you were doing um, a model where you had bred, for example, castanias to C57 one six, yeah. and you're trying to discriminate between the two genomes, and you were using the same data, but you're 
Well, yeah, I mean, the fragment sizes are more about how you build the, how you transform that data into, into essentially signal intensities. So where that nucleus, where that chip seek peak is, rather than the mappability so itself. Right, so now you're getting, so this is a fairly specific case. So now we're talking about, about uh, mixing two strains of mice together to get us um, variants that we can use to then predict paternal and maternal allele. And there you're going to see a little bit of advantage in the paired end sequencing because you're going to get perhaps some of those variants that, that wouldn't be, um, that would throw the aligner off because you, depending on how you set your, your, your thresholds for doing the alignment, as, as we'll talk about, so the seed length, right? Because you're going to be able to rescue some of those. And in other cases, like retroviolet elements, paired end reads can be very important. So if you're interested in repetitive regions of the genome, right? And maybe some of these are the regions that you're talking about, we can leverage the paired end because as we'll talk about, if you've got a retroviral element in the genome, let's say this element is found a thousand or a hundred times in the genome. When we place one read, so let's say this is read one, um, we place, when the aligner places it correctly in the retroviral element, it doesn't know what retroviral element it is in the genome. And the way aligners handle that is they just report one randomly. So they'll say, okay, I, I know it'll be, it's mapping quality zero, it's in a hundred places in the genome, I'm going to place it here, right? So that's, so that's how it deals with it. But if you have paired end reads, you can actually anchor it by its paired end, which is somewhere else flanking that retroviral element. And now we know that this is a uniquely mapped read. So we know that because this uniquely mapped read is, is in this place in the genome, we know that the retroviral element is actually this one because it, it couldn't possibly be one on a different chromosome or, you know, kilobases away. So, so that is some, some, some ways of using the paired end data. In the Castaneous um, example, um, I imagine there must be some, um, probably more than 2% mappability. I'm, I'm giving you the example for, the, for a human genome. Um, so you're going to see a little bit better mappability. Um, but I don't think it's going to be, um, you know, it, it's... Martin, you also probably, just, in this example, you can relax a number of mismatches. You can allow more mismatches and then risk your alignability with the pair end. Because yep. as more mismatches you allow, then you can map the read in multiple locations, but the spare end, you can still rescue this. So, so. Yeah, so this gets into the question of sensitivity and specificity. So as we'll get into, you can adjust the map, the, how, you, what, how you tell the aligner, like BWA, how to do the, uh, the alignment um, and how many mismatches it will allow and still place that seed. And, and as Misha says, you can leverage paired end reads slightly differently. I, that's not a common application, and I would caution people doing that unless you really know what you're doing. I would just use the default, um, you know, uh, two when mismatches. Use, uh, when you use uh, mouse string, which is not reference, of course you would expect that. Sure, be, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. It would allow a little bit more freedom for reads because you know that there is variations in your sequence. So. Yeah. So, so is somebody managing the money, you know, it's important to know the difference of the level of So, there is quite a price difference There is, but it's not double, right? No. So I would argue that, I mean, I think hopefully Misha will, Misha will talk about some of the other advantages just in the, con in the concept of being able to predict where that, nu where that nucleosome is in the genome, with, which, which um, you know, I think has value in it itself. Um, maybe, maybe if you're just windowing the genome into two, you know, a KB region, you, maybe you don't care exactly where that nucleosome is. Um, but certainly you're going to get more high resolution in the nucleosome mapping because you actually know what exactly the fragment was that you IP'd. Um, so I, I can say personally, at, at least in, in my own lab, I always do paired end reads. By the time you've invested in the molecular biology, the, the sample and all the rest of it, it's a it's an incrementally it's an incremental increase in cost of read, but I think there's value in it, and, and I think Misha will will go through that beyond just the mappability question, which is an important one. Yeah, I think someone had a question. Yes. No, they're different things. So mate pairs um, align 
out. So mate pairs were, are, were, I don't know if people still do mate pairs, do they? Well, less and less. Less, yeah. So mate pairs were a way of making long insert sizes. So they, they actually involved generation of a circular fragment. This is not related to epigenetics. <laughs> but, I just read it sometimes. Yeah, so mate pairs are not the same as paired ends. And if you align a mate pair library using standard you know, paired end uh, alignment um, defaults, it won't work. Because the reads are actually, a, it's actually a, a ligated fragment where you're, um, where you're uh, ligating together two pieces of the genome that are far apart. And this is used for you know, essentially chromosomes, like uh, uh, assembly, genome assemblies and things like that. It's not used so much anymore because now we have long read technologies such as, um, you know, uh, so, sorry, such as PacBio, for example, Oxford Nanopore, another example uh, of long read technologies. Um, and there are other strategies now like 10x genomics where we're actually tagging individual so we're actually adding indexes and we're able to assemble uh, contexts together. So not used as much, but it, at the time it was, it was something that was actually quite um, popular probably five or ten years ago. Five years, ten years ago. Anyway, mate pairs are not the same as paired end. Good question. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so anyway, just to just remind you that's how that works. Um, okay, so now we're going to get into the, the actual file types. Oh my gosh. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be quick. Um, so just so we start with the images, and as Guillaume just mentioned, the images are now deleted real time. When NGS first started, we kept the images. Some of us might remember those days. Um, you know, we used to have a, a little tiny compute cluster, a three-node cluster, sitting underneath the image, under, underneath the sequencer, and it was actually the lore is, and this is what I heard. But it was it was a co-op student at Illumina who actually came up with the with the the algorithm that does so-called real time analysis where the images are converted in real time uh, to generate the sequences and then that are dumped. So there was a time when we actually were, were asked to submit the images into the repositories, into SGA or S, uh, SRA, but uh, clearly that's non, uh, not, not scalable. And now we, don't, we, now we don't keep them, right? But uh, again, that's something we can discuss over, over coffee. Okay, so um, uh, two, I think there are two things that I wanna talk about. So um, one is chastity filtering. Um, so this is uh, something that you will see in the image files. Um, and this is one of the quality metrics that, um, uh, that the Illumina sequencer um, generates. Um, so what is chastity filtering? Chastity filtering relates to the question that was asked earlier about that orange cluster, that cluster that is a mixture of two different uh, fluorescent um, nucleotides. So, so the idea behind chastity filtering is when you first start looking at those, when you first start generating that focal map, how, um, how um, unique is that signature or how um, pure is that signature that's being generated um, from, that, from, that, um, uh, from that cluster? Is it one fluorescent um, signal primarily or is it a mixture of two fluorescent signals which might indicate that you've got a polyclonal cluster? So you can imagine that you could have two, new, two DNA strands that actually annealed right next to one another. And when we, generated the, when we generate that cluster, it's actually going to be a mixture of two strands. That's problematic for a lot of reasons, as I hope you, you can understand. And so this concept of chastity filtering was, was uh, developed. And essentially, it's a very simple algorithm. It's the brightest intensity, so the brightest signal uh, over the brightest signal plus the second brightest signal. And it has to be greater than or equal to 0.6. And it, Right now, or the most recent algorithm of this is it calculates it over the first 25 bases, uh, and it allows uh, one uh, one failure. So chastity filtering is 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 one of the flags that's part of the the uh, uh, part of the FASTQ um, encoding uh, of the sequence name, and is one of the um, uh, uh, one of the quality metrics, or one of the important quality metrics uh, that is generated from the sequencing it's, itself. The other component, which I'm, I'm not going to spend time in, but just very briefly, is the concept of phasing and pre-phasing. So you can imagine if you've got a thousand molecules where you're incorporating sequence bases at every cycle, eventually you're going to get, or even at every cycle, you're going to get some that don't incorporate. So you get out of phase, so these become phased. Or you get some that incorporate more than one base at every cycle, and they become pre-phased. And so as you, as you extend out 100 bases, you get more and more of these that become out of phase, 
And so then when you're shining the laser and trying to determine what the signal is at that particular position, um, it starts to become a mixed signal and eventually the actual, um, it, it becomes impossible to determine what the actual primary base is. So that's phasing and pre-phasing, and that's another uh, characteristic of the platform. Of course, single, nucleate, single molecule sequencing technologies, like let's use the example of Oxford Nanopore, have, have a bigger problem because they don't have a, they're not making a consensus call of that cluster. They're actually, they get one determination of what that sequence is, and that's it. Whereas Illumina and other clonal-based platforms, you, you have, you know, you're, you're basically taking a consensus call. And that gives us the higher qualities that we see on Illumina platform versus single, single molecule technologies like PacBio, like Oxford Nanoport. They don't have that consensus call. So that's a real fundamental difference between the two. Okay, the other thing that's important to remember is that we encode base qualities, and we encode base qualities using this log transformation. So it's essentially a probability. Um, and this is the Q score, the ma or the base quality score. Um, this uh, original, the original um, base quality or FRED score um, comes from um, Phil's revised editor. So that's where the name FRED comes from. Um, and this was actually developed as part of the human genome sequencing project. So when we started sequencing genomes in anger to generate the human genome, we needed a way of encoding quality. Uh, into the bases. How do we know that that base is of any that base call is of any quality? Uh, and so um, this um, uh, concept of, of the FRED score was developed, and again, it's a log transformation of a probabilities. And the probabilities are empirically determined from the data. Um, so the initial Selexa or an NGS platform sequencing data was the qualities were based entirely on misalignments to the reference genome. But as we did more sequencing, we were able to develop, we developed a probability score, uh, and then that's encoded in the genome. Okay, in the, in the last uh, few minutes here, so this is uh, an intermediate file that I just wanted to show you just to kind of give you a, a feel for how we get from um, the Illumina uh, file into the FASTQ file. So just to kind of break it down for you. So the, of course, the, the, the major components is the sequence string itself. That should be fairly self-evident. Um, and then the base qualities, and the base qualities are here. And the base qualities, of course, don't look like 20, 30, 40, 50, right, as, as you would expect from a, from a FRED quality, uh, or from a, a FRED score. And that's because they've been encoded in ASCII. And ASCII is just a way of compressing um, two digits to one digit to save space. Of course, we're dealing with files that are millions of lines long, so it's a very simplistic way of transforming that into a, uh, into a basically into a way of compressing it, uh, a non-lossy uh, compression. Now, the information up here is, is the information that I've been kind of going on about, which is how we, um, how we name this read. So we have the instrument, in this case, the run number, the lane, so this is the third lane, the tile, 1,101, and then the X and the Y coordinate, okay? So this is the information that's concatenated together to uniquely identify the read, as, as you'll see um, uh, as we get through the, uh, 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 through the, through the lectures. Um, I, this is just the ASCII uh, encoding. Um, we use ASCII 33, which is the, the, the base encoding of most or of all FASTQ files now. There was a time when, for whatever reason, Illumina was using ASCII 64. And that's just the base that you use, that you, and you need to know the base to be able to uh, convert from an ASCII score into a quality score. So if you looked here, you'd see that H encodes 104. Because this is one of the original Illumina, Illumina used to encode in 64. So it would be 104 minus 64 would give you a quality score of 40. So you'll see if you go back into some of the older data that's generated in the public, uh, public um, uh, repositories, um, you'll see that some of the older data is, enco is encoded within ASCII 64. All data from the last five years, I think, or so is in ASCII 33, um, which is, uh, 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 which it, it essentially is a different base. So ASCII 33 is the last non-character, which is why it was used um, in, in, in coding. Okay, so we put this all together to generate the FASTQ file. So this is what a FASTQ file looks like. It's got four lines. Um, the first line is an at, and it's, then it's got a string, which is essentially 
incorporating that information, and we'll go through that in a little bit more detail in the next uh, module. So we have the name of the sequence, the sequence string, there's a plus sign, and sometimes this, this string will be repeated at the plus sign, but typically it's blank. Um, and then the, um, the ASCII encoded quality scores are there, and then we start with the next sequence, and so on, and so on, and so on. So FASTQ files are four-line files that encode the sequence, and the sequence quality, and the sequence name. Yeah? I don't know. You mean the plus line? I don't know why it was put there. I don't know. It's a good question. Why, why do we need this line, right? Because we're obviously, it's taking space. So the, this, the FASTQ file was developed by the Sanger Center, um, again, as a way of encoding NGS data. When next generation sequence data was first generated, it was all just FASTA files, no associated quality. The FASTQ file was a way of collapsing the sequence and the quality together into a standardized format, and then it was really just adopted um, worldwide and has become the standard. Again, ASCII is encoded in base 33, so remember that, base 33 encoding um, for, the, for the qualities. Um, yeah, and I have no idea why there's a plus. I should maybe look into that. I don't know. Well, sometimes they add the sequence information, so it's not just plus. It's yeah, well, plus. sometimes you get a repeat. Right. The things I've seen is actually just a repeat of the name, but then... But, but, but why, <laughs> right? Like, why would you want to repeat the name? Maybe um, even number is better. Even number will read better than odd numbers. Three, three might be. Read, like Could be. Could be. Good question. Okay. Um, so I think in the next module we'll go through this. So maybe it's time for a coffee break. I'm a little bit over time. Um, so we'll talk about sequencing quality, library quality, and IP quality as we go into module one. <clears throat> yeah, so sorry. Usually I finish, but I'm just going to say a few more words, and then David's going to go through module one, um, which will include the first computational component, which is uh, running FASTQC, which is very easy. It's, this is a good introduction uh, into uh, the computational side of things. But I just wanted to briefly mention, okay, you've completed your chip seek experiment, or you've obtained the data uh, from a collaborator, or you've done it yourself. How do you assess the quality uh, of the resulting FASTQ file? So really there are three main ways, uh, the sequencing quality, and that's what FASTQC is a package that we use in the lab to look at the quality of the, the actual sequencing library, of course, or the sequencing file. Of course, you've got a file that's got 10 million or, or you know, 50 million lines long. How do you assess the quality? You need some way of summarizing the quality. FASTQC is a tool that's used, um, uh, uh, has been used for, for many years to do this. Uh, it comes, comes out of the Bainbridge uh, Institute, uh, something that, that, that uh, provides a nice summary. Um, the other component is library quality. How do you know that the library itself is, is of good quality? And you know, I was talking a little bit with Sarah at the break. You know, understanding the, the biology end of things or how the experiment was done, whether it was MNAs digested, whether it was crosslinked, what kind of antibody was used, all of this is critical to your interpretation. You can have an experiment that was done two different ways, and you'll get, you, you may have different conclusions um, purely based on technical differences. So you really need to pay attention to this. And of course, the IP quality itself. So this is the tool that we're going to run. You can run this tool um, both using a user interface, um, but we're going to run it using command line um, in, in, this, in module one. Um, and it'll generate a, a file, an HTML file, which then you can go through. Um, and look at the uh, look at the outputs um, in, in the in the various categories that it generates. This is something you should run for all of your FASTQ files that you generate. There are other wrapper tools that can do this, uh, can run FASTQC, um, or you can run FASTQC across a, a whole number of different um, uh, data sets. But again, it's important to understand the data type that you're running and the output of the FASTQC. So you'll see that there are examples where FASTQ has thrown a warning and said, wait a second, you know, there might be something wrong with this FASTQC, or this, this uh, sequence data. But it's because it's an IP library, so it has certain characteristics, and you need to keep this in mind. OK, so I spent a little bit of time talking about this, but this is something that we um, spend a lot of time looking at, which is DNA fragment length. And I just wanted to make the point here. So this is essentially a distribution of the paired end reads once we align them to the genome. And we can simply ask, if we look, what's the distribution of insert sizes that we get? So now we're, we're, we're of course, leveraging paradigm reads. We spent some time talking about this. But, but of course, we've, we've, we've got our sequence fragment with our 
and we've basically read from either end. So we've got the ends. We can align those back to the genome, as we'll talk about, and then generate a, uh, an insert distribution. I just wanted to make the point that, so here uh, you can see the input, which is this black line here. So there's a whole series of experiments that were run here. And you can see that the input is nearly identical. Well, the input shows what the expected distribution is, which is around a single nucleosome, right? So that would tell us that our MNAs digestion was near completion in the sense that what we got back was essentially a, a single nucleosome around 150 base pairs. Um, for those of you who are interested, we also sometimes see these shoulders of smaller length size, and you probably will see this in your data as well, especially MNAs data. This is something that I've been trying to get a student to look at for, for many years. Um, it's quite interesting that we see these shoulders of a smaller size just by MNAs digestion, which might be reflective of some other um, uh, nucleosome structure, but I'll just leave it at that. Okay, so this was the input, and then we did IPs, which, which either H3, anti-H3K4 trimethylation or anti-H3K27 <coughs> trimethylation. And the point I want to make here is that we see a shift in the distribution, so actually shifting the distribution of the input up, right, suggesting that in fact, we have a dinucleosome form here that's being enriched with the H3K27 trimethylation. This is a typical trace. Again, there are many, many experiments that are run here that you'll see in, a, in an MNAs digestion. So you're actually enriching for a larger fragment size um, because of uh, the, the IP. And Sarah, Sarah was just discussing that in her lab when she does H3K4 trimethylation, when she sees an, a shift up, it's a, a, it's a representative that perhaps the data quality isn't as good. So taking a, a look at this, the insert sizes are, is a critical component of, of the quality. This is obviously after sequencing, but there is technology such as the Agilent Bioanalyzer that some of you might be aware of. It's something you can use before you run the library to actually look at the insert size uh, and, and see, whether you, um, uh, uh, see whether you're seeing a shift uh, or not, okay? So insert size is something. <clears throat> And then there's a whole series of metrics that we can use to actually say, is the IP quality of good quality? And this isn't, I wouldn't say this is a solved problem. One of the things we do at our center is to compare it to a compendium of existing data uh, to try and get an understanding of where our library is on the distribution. Because of course we don't have a gold standard in ChIPC. We don't know what the answer is. And so the question is, well, how good is the quality of the library that we're sequencing um, and, and how will that, you know, how confident can we be uh, in that data? And again, Misha's going to talk about this uh, in, in, in more depth. So obviously the, the amount of sequencing that you generate uh, is an important component. You, you want to be within the range um, that I talked about. Um, if, you're, if you sequence too lightly, um, if you're sequencing, say, 5, 10 million reads, um, you're going to have a much harder time distinguishing signal from noise. Again, Misha will talk about this. Um, and so sequencing to the appropriate depth, depth is important. Um, the number of reads that align uniquely to the genome is another measure of quality. Typically, well, in some cases, um, oftentimes, if you have a poor quality ChIP-seq library, you'll see that you get many reads that align to repetitive regions of the genome. Um, this is a characteristic in, indeed of other types of IPs, such as NEDIF libraries. So looking at what fraction of your reads line within, within the uh, unique lineable region of the genome is important. Another library quality measure that you can derive from, <clears throat> from the primary alignments is PCR duplicates. So you, if you have, so here is a whole distribution of, of libraries. So this is libraries that we generated um, in the lab. Um, from low PCR duplicate rates to some that are high <coughs> PCR duplicate rates. So if you're getting in the range of 10 or 20 or 30 percent PCR duplicates, um, you likely have over amplified your library and the quality of the resulting data is going to be impacted. And finally, um, another way to look at it is to look for expectations. So I've told you some characteristics of of where we expect the reads, so you can leverage that information. So for example, for H3K27 acetylation, we may say, well, I know that K27 acetylation is associated with enhancer states. So if I just simply ask how many of the reads that I align align within known enhancer state regions, and I can pull these down from resources such as UCSC Genome Browser, um, from the ENCODE consortium, from the IHEC uh, genome portal, you can generate, you can pull down a set, uh, all of the enhancer states or a set of enhancer states that have been annotated 
for either your cell type or a related cell type, and you can simply ask where, how many of my reads align within those enhancer states. And you can see if you're, if you've only got a few percentage, um, you know, you might have some, some concerns about the quality of the data. Um, and, and of course, um, another way to look at it is within gene bodies for H3K36. You expect the majority of your H3K36 sequences to align within gene bodies. If you find that you have no enrichment in gene bodies, then you might have some, um, some um, uh, concerns about the quality of the data. Okay, so, and again, we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about um, um, metrics. So I just wanted to introduce that really briefly. And now David is going to start module one where we introduce the compute, um, uh, uh, compute Canada node and then run through FastQC.